Okay, we're back. We're live. It's the one o'clock block on a given and very wet Tuesday here in Honolulu on ThinkTech. And uh, this is Community Matters. And we're talking about a book uh, from the desk of the Attorney General, a memoir by David M. Louis. And David joins us today. Hi, David. Uh, how are you doing, Jay? Nice to have you uh, have me here. I have, uh, I have some you know, preliminary thoughts I want to express to you. And that is to me, looking at this book, it goes on the same bookshelf as Michener's Hawaii, in terms of educating people about the state, Michener's Hawaii, Hawaii Pono, Land and Power, and there might be one more. Um, but this is the bookshelf that uh, documents the history of the state inside, you know, tells you about the essence of the state. And this book is right up there with the others. That's my reaction. What's oh. your reaction? Thank you so much, Jay. That's so very nice of you to say such kind things about me. I was just trying to give people a behind the curtain look at what the heck goes on in government. For most people, they think it's a black box. They have no clue how it is. They think it's all screwed up, but they have no clue how it actually works. And, you know, it works like anything else. There's a bunch of people. They've got agreements and commitments and rules and, and processes, and, and that's how it works. And Yeah, but you said that the rules in politics, um, they're kind of vague. Some people say there are no rules. <laughs> exactly. Sometimes there are no rules. That's yeah. true. Yeah. They're very anyway, few rules. It's a, it's a great learning experience to look through this book. I, um, I'll tell you why. Um, it's because, you know, if you've been reading the newspaper over the past 20 years or so, um, you, you know, you know a certain amount of what happens. But that's the newspaper. This is, this is beyond the newspaper. This is, you know, a drill down from the newspaper. Um, if you want to look back, if you're inclined to do that and, and deal on the same issues and events that happened that you knew a little something about from reading the newspaper, this book will show, will show you what really happened, which it's an amazing revelation, actually, because it teaches you things you never imagined at the time. Well, thank you, Jay. Uh, and, and you know, I, I lived through a bunch of these things and they were quite amazing. It's, uh, I was really privileged to have the seat at the table, uh, quite frankly. And, and uh, I'm, I'm really grateful to Governor Abercrombie for picking me uh, and then for bringing me into the inner circle, which, which was really uh, quite nice, uh, quite a leap of faith by him and, and uh, an eye-opening education for me. Yeah, you gave up a very thriving practice. You gave up uh, a practice with a lot of prestige in your, you know, in your in your background, your CV. Um, and uh, I, you know, I guess I wonder this question. So you gave up that practice to join the Abercrombie administration, which, you know, uh, depends on how you see it. Regrettably, only lasted four years. You were only there. You couldn't have been there for more than four years. Um, query: uh, Would we be having this conversation if it was eight years? <laughs> uh, would you have written this book if it was eight years? Would you have taken a second four years? I would have taken a second four years. Actually, uh, I, I initially committed to four years uh, with the governor because I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Uh, once I got into it, I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, it certainly does not have the, the money associated with private practice, but the psychic rewards the ability to have a seat at the table, the, bil the ability to be inside and to participate in helping to make history and helping to steer the ship of state, state is unparalleled. And I enjoyed every minute of it. I really, I said in the book, it was the best job I ever have had. And, and quite frankly, I mean it. it. It really was the best job. So I would have done it for eight years uh, if Governor Abercrombie had, had been able to get reelected. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, events conspired against him and conspired against me. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, eight years being away from practice is uh, longer than four. <clears throat> and I wonder, and anybody who goes from a, a thriving law practice, uh, uh, the kind of, um, you know, the kind of legal experience you were having uh, to go into government, you know, and shroud yourself in government, uh, takes the risk of losing momentum, yeah? And uh, you lose a certain amount of momentum in four years, but you lose more of that in eight years. And I, I wonder if you had some trepidation about going into it. And I wonder if you ever thought, gee whiz, am I losing touch because I'm in government rather than in my practice? Yeah, you know, absolutely. I, I was trepidatious about it and very concerned about it. And, and um, 
And so it was a, it was a big decision. Uh, I, I would say that uh, coming out, I, I got a lot of help from a lot of friends, a lot of strangers too, and I was able to reestablish my practice and and uh, you know do do very fine. Uh, so I'm I'm doing fine. Had I had I been able to stay for eight years, I, I might have chosen a different path. It was all very very heady, all very very uh, satisfying, uh, and. Uh, quite frankly, you know, that's one of the messages I have. People should engage. People should participate. People should do public service. Um, I found that, that my stint in public service was extremely rewarding. Uh, and, and so I would encourage others to do it. And they can go in and then they can come out and, and still uh, participate in private practice. It's not easy. <laughs> it's <laughs> the transition, hard. yeah. Yeah, transitions are always tough, uh, but it was very, very rewarding. Well, you know, you, you, you couldn't have picked a more active four years. And, you know, when I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, your book and having this discussion with you, I, I could not resist thinking about the Truman Show, if you remember that movie with Jim Carrey. Um, it's like, uh, let's see, how will we challenge David today? It's almost somebody's up there trying to figure out how to how to make you jump around. And indeed, you had so many issues going on, so many, you know, political issues and environmental issues and historical issues. I mean, how did you deal with that? You you must have said, does this happen to everybody? It can't happen to everybody. Somebody's up there making it happen to me. Well, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about that job, and, and I thought it was a big job going in, but I had really no idea. Uh, being the top lawyer for the state uh, with all the myriad of issues that the state has uh, is immense. It's, it's, for a lawyer, it's like being in a candy store and not knowing uh, which one to eat. You're going to eat the chocolates, you're going to eat the, the caramels, you're going you're gonna to eat the, the Pop-Tarts. What are you going to eat? Um, and, and so there's all kinds of things. The only really saving grace about the whole thing was the smart people at the Department of the Attorney General the staff, the, the career people who had been there and had been toiling away and let me take all the credit while they did all the work. Uh, and they were terrific. Uh, they, so it, 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 I had a lot of help. Uh, I had to read a lot. I had to study a lot. I had to learn a lot. Um, uh, but, you know, I mean, if you follow current events, you, you have some background in, in these things. And, and so you, you find out what the issues are find out what the legal pressure points are and then and then you you know find out what the political actors want to do um and and then try and help them and help yourself and and try and establish good legal policy and good decisions uh so so it's it's a it's a constant balancing act but but it was really a tremendous experience well before you uh, went into that job you had a what i say a medium sized firm that you were a founder of that firm uh and when you came out of that job Four years later, you went to a firm that was a bigger firm, not the biggest in town, but a bigger firm. Um, and nobody will argue that the Department of the, the Office of the Attorney General is the biggest law firm in the state by far. And so part of the job while you're there has to be to manage all the human resources, to manage a firm this size. Who gets to do what? Who gets to research what? Um, how do you check and verify and you know, and build teamwork uh, that will give you the best answer. This sounds pretty complicated, even in a, well, in a small firm, in a large firm, but in a super large firm like the Attorney General's office, that sounds pretty challenging all by itself. Well, true. Um, I had experience because I had managed my firm for 20 years. Um, and, and I had done it even before then when I was at, a, at another large firm, Case and Lynch, uh, back in the day I'd been on the management committees. Um, and, and, and so, you know, you just apply yourself and you apply what you know and what you've learned uh, and what you know about human nature and you delegate. And I had the support of terrific supervisors who could manage troops and manage people to, to do the research. I dealt with, I think, about a third of the attorneys because it was a very broad kind of a thing. There were constant new issues. Uh, but I would, the, the great thing about uh, the attorney general's office is, is, it's the result that matters. It's not the economics. In, in, in private practice, you're always worried about what are the economics? Who's going to pay for all these bodies? Who's going who's gonna to uh, pay the freight? Um, and we were more concerned at the AG's office about what's the right result? 
What do we need? Who, who are the people we need to get into the room and let's get them in the room and try and figure out what's going on and what is the recommended course of action. And so that was, that was a terrific luxury in some ways. Now you can't go crazy, obviously. You gotta still be reasonable about your judicious use of resources. But, but we were able to really focus on what are the key metrics, what are the key things that have to be done, uh, and, you know, and, and, and provide fidelity to the Constitution, both of the United States and of Hawaii, and then the law, and, and, and then figure out, well, what is the right thing to do? Uh, yeah, right. I, and I, you had plenty of material in the book about that. You know, how do you pick the right course? So sometimes uh, I'm sure you did not agree with the governor. You did not agree with some of the department heads uh, or, or for that matter, the lawyers you were supervising. And uh, you, had, you had to find a way to apply your moral imprimatur, uh, your sense of the rule of law on top of all of this. And uh, sometimes it isn't easy. It isn't, it isn't, it isn't easy, is it? No, and you know, uh, you got to make some decisions sometimes. And, and uh, uh, there's a line I quoted in the, in the book from uh, uh, Dick Francis, uh, uh, um, where he says, uh, I forget the name of the book, but, but uh, the saying was, uh, thought before action, if there's time. And I love that because, you know, sometimes there's no time. And, and sometimes there's plenty of time. Um, and, and sometimes it's close and it's a balancing act. And, you know, the, there you, you got five minutes, think fast. You have one hour, think fast. That's it. Make your move. <laughs> but you have to have a strong stomach sometimes because all those pressures, all the time pressures, uh, um, the, the people pressures, the human resource pressures, the political pressures, and put a lot of pressure on you. And it, you know what it needs? It needs a litigator, David, just like you. Am I right? I think having a litigation background really, really helped. Uh, it, it, you know, litigation teaches you to work with teams, to, to f you know, mold teams and put them together, and and then to put on a production for a particular goal. Um, and and uh, you know, that is, is a great training, great training for me. I, I'm not saying non-litigators can't do it; they can. Um, but but the litigation background certainly helped. Well, your book, your book gives us kind of like the whole enchilada. Uh, we get to see the big things, the little things. We get to connect up with the news as we remember it from that particular four-year period of time. Um, you know, we're covering so many things. You know, it was like a roller coaster, at least just looking at the book. Here's the cover of the book. Let me see that one more time. Uh, that's the cover of the book. It's really nice looking, by the way, David. Thank um, you. So um, with all of that material, all of those issues and events, uh, that you were experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis, I would guess it, it was like uh, seven times twenty-four times three sixty-five. Um, <laughs> you have, you must have some favorite cases, and I wonder if you could tell us your very favorite case in terms of challenge, in terms of process, in terms of outcome. Well, you know, I'd have to say that the signature thing that we did that uh, was same-sex marriage. Um, Same-sex marriage has uh, a long history, um, and, and because of the confluence of events nationally, it finally came to the <laughs> fore. The fact that the Hawaii state legislature had overturned and overruled the Hawaii Supreme Court 1993 decision of Bear versus Lewin, where the Hawaii Supreme Court said, hey, same-sex marriage is, is a matter of equal protection. But the country wasn't ready for it. And the country became ready for it in uh, 2013 uh, with the Hawaii, with the U.S. Supreme Court uh, ruling. And then Governor Abercrombie said, "Okay, let's pass same-sex marriage." And he called the special session, which is the absolute right call. There is no way you could get a giant cultural complex issue through the legislature in regular session. And so we did that. Uh, I testified at the legislature. It was very moving to me. It was a, an issue of social justice, of equality, of opportunity, um, and, and uh, it, it was tremendous. And, and a lot of people came together. I mean, there were a lot of opposition people uh, who also were fervent, um, uh, but I felt that it was the right thing to do. And then after we pushed it through the legislature and got it signed, you know, Governor, Ab Governor Abercrombie had a big signing ceremony, and he, and he read this letter. <clears throat> where this, this uh, uh, person wrote and said, 
you know, thank you so much. Uh, uh, we were invisible before and now people see us. It was quite moving. And then uh, we were able to do court cases about it too, because there was a court challenge to the law. And, and I went down and argued that uh, in, in front of uh, the judge and, and uh, got the motion uh, to dismiss uh, that case. And it eventually went up to the Hawaii Supreme Court and they affirmed that the law was, was appropriate and constitutional. So, so that was a big issue, giant issue, uh, and very personally satisfying to be a part of it. I, I can't take credit for the whole thing. There were so many people who worked on that. So many people at the AGs, the legislature, um, you know, all kinds of political people. Um, but to be a part of it and to, to sit at the table and to help steer it uh, was, was very, very satisfying. Yeah, it was a piece of history, not only, not only in Hawaii, but around the world. It was, it was the shot heard around the world, wasn't it? Yeah, no, and they just passed it in uh, Chile, I think. Um, I just saw the feed yesterday uh, about, you know, some of these places are, are uh, uh, recognizing same-sex marriage, same -sex marriage and, and it's appropriate, you know. I mean, people, people should be able to live their lives. People should be able to, to love who they want to, to, to spend their, their lives with the people that they love. Um, and, and so... Um, you know, I'm fine with that, and, and, and I wanted to enable that. You know, there's been some press about how in the pipeline there are cases headed toward the United States Supreme Court that challenge the whole thing, want a, a reversal uh, along the lines of the reversal they seek in Roe v. Wade. Um, and um, that could happen. With this Supreme Court, that could happen. What are your thoughts about that? Well, this Supreme Court is very conservative, and uh, it certainly looks like they're going to overturn Roe versus Wade. I don't think they're going to overturn same-sex marriage. Um, I, I, I don't think that they're going to do that. that. That would be a bridge too far for even the conservatives, I think, on, on this. But you never know. I can't predict that. The thing about constitutional law is that these justices are making it up, okay? There's no precedent. Uh, and they're and they feel free to disregard precedent, uh, and and so in, in many ways, you know, Justice Sotomayor said it. Um, they're political actors, um, and so they, they they have to temper their political activism with not moving too quickly and with trying to respect prior precedent. But there are really very few checks on them uh, to do that, so it's difficult. Yeah, um, there, there was an article in the Times uh, on Sunday um, calling what they had done gaslighting the country uh, in terms of the, you know, the questions uh, and their re responses uh, in the Supreme Court hearing on Roe v. Wade. We'll, we'll see what we'll see. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you on the other flip side of that question. Here you had four years of um, high action, may I call it? Um, what was your least favorite case or issue? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, you want me to kiss and tell? Um, uh, I don't do it in the book, and I, and, and, and in general, I, 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 I don't. Um, but you know, dealing with some um, actors who wanted different results than what I felt was right, or uh, was, you know, th those were challenging times. Uh, and and uh, some of them were more aggressive uh, than others. Um, but, you know, I had the law on my side in terms of what my authority was. I had statutory power. I had constitutional power. Um, I had precedent. And so I would tell them, you know, look, this is the way it is. I understand you don't like it. I understand you, you may not like it a lot. And you're going to express it to me, uh, but I'm going to do it the way I think the law and the Constitution requires. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's got, you know, I mean, really, this, this book should be read nationwide, I'm telling you right now. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what's interesting is that you, you came at this from a, a career of practicing law, and now it's something completely different. And you had to, you know, go to the occasion of, of looking carefully at government, at politics, at, 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 at public um, opinion, mores, and the state of Hawaii with its special culture. 
And, and, and of course, the rule of law is always an issue. Um, and the role of the attorney general, there's so many things to, you know, be fresh impressions for you, fresh lessons. And I, I just wonder if you could capsulize for us, and you did cover it in the book, um, what you learned, what you learned about government, about Hawaii, about politics, and about your own interaction with those things in those four years. It's like um, ha having a, a very heavy college course, or maybe a graduate degree. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, the, the, as I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of people have no idea what government does. It's, it's a black box to them. It's a mystery. Uh, it's, it's, you know, a, a closed kind of a thing to them. And, and the fact of the matter is, is, is that government is one, it's, it's a huge, important institution, and it's too important to be left to others. Everybody needs to engage. Um, I'm certainly glad I engaged. I'm certainly glad I participated. And what I learned was, is that, you know, you can make your voice heard. Even the smallest, most insignificant person by voting, they can make their voice heard. But, but beyond that, you have advocates who step up, uh, you have public policy advocates uh, who step up and try and make their voices heard and, and look for good government and things like that. You, now you have special interests uh, who are, you know, spending lots of money and trying to get their point of view across. That's democracy as we know it. Um, and the important thing from my perspective is, is people need to engage. That, that's what I learned, is, is that it's important to engage. You know, I came out and, and some things happened, and, and now I'm in a position where it's like, um, I, I actually know what to do and how to fix certain things, or, or how to at least tee them up for possible others to make good decisions, uh, to, to right wrongs, or to fix things and make life a little bit better for everybody else. So I think that's the one thing I took away, was it's not unknowable. It's, it's, it's a process of people like anything else. And you just have to get in there and engage and make your voice heard so that you can both represent yourself and you can make your views known um, and you can hopefully um, help move us all forward to a better tomorrow. That's what I'm looking at. Well, it's, you know, if, if that was true in the, in the period you served and you know, when you got out to do a retrospective look at it, it's certainly much more true today. Um, you know, the only, some people say the only way to save our democracy is to engage with it, just as you say. There was an article a few days ago in the Atlantic, a really, it's a famous, it will be a famous article, just the way your book will be a famous book by uh, Barton Gelman, who is one of the principals in, in the Atlantic. And uh, it's, it's actually reduced to audio. It's an hour and a half of audio. And the, the proposition there is uh, you have some serious problems in this country. And uh, there's nobody right now who stands up as someone who is going to be able to solve them. You don't see the solutions uh, that are persuasive coming up. Um, but the one thing, I and mean, he discusses various options, and it's worth listening to him. Um, the one thing that uh, seems to come up more than anything else is the citizens have got to take a stand on the rule of law. They have to engage. They have to speak out. You know, this is one of the reasons, David, um, you know, that think tech exists. And, and I know it's one of the reasons you are on the board, full disclosure, you're on our board. Um, so what do you think about that? What do you think about saving the country? What do you think about Barton Gelman's concern and his potential solutions? Yeah, you know, I totally agree. I, I uh, the, the thing is, is, and, and I find myself in the trap uh, many times. I'm tired. I don't want to listen to somebody I think is an idiot. I don't want to listen to contrary views that I think are totally misguided, that ignore science, that ignore logic, that are, that are there for petty concerns. And yet, my view on the thing is, is we need to engage we need to treat other people with respect. We need to hear them out. And we need to try and work together. And there's plenty of people doing this on, on NPR and, and talking about this in the Atlantic. We need to stay away from our um, closed bubbles, our echo chambers, where we only listen to the others, to, to what makes sense to us. And, and we won't countenance uh, another point of view, and we won't recognize that other people have 
other points of view and we think they're all idiots because if that happens and we all retreat and we can't engage and we can't talk then we're not going to be able to have a shared future and if if we can't have a shared future then we're going to devolve into warfare and and sniping and violence and all of those other bad things and and so i think it's absolutely necessary that people have to be able to engage and find a way to talk to other people without being i guess overly aggressive without turning people off without um uh, you know demonizing the other people uh there was a there was a a piece on npr about about this woman who who encountered a you know uncle larry the racist uncle at the christmas dinner and, and what she said was hey uncle larry you know you know i i know you you're actually a good person and those nasty things you know and, and you'd run into a burning building to save people regardless of race but but i can't square that with what you just said all those nasty things you just said about mexican americans you know <laughs> how how is that so that rather than attacking him she was trying to you know point out to him challenge him you got to challenge you have to challenge but by challenging in a sort of a, a a softer manner i think it's a it's a potentially much more fruitful yeah as you said the book appealing to his better angels yeah yeah right now that's the thing i mean it's it's really tough and 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 i i do believe i mean we have a lot of polarization in this country not not it we have some in hawaii but it's nothing like the polarization that exists on the mainland uh, you know, david um you know you've been through law firms big and small hither and yon you've had the experience of an attorney general and done well at it um would you ever consider running for office david this is David Louis, David M. Louis. I'm asking now. <laughs> oh, I think I'm past that as far as my career uh, goes. And, uh, I've I've never really been a retail politician, somebody who who likes to get out there and press the flesh. And and you have to be a special person to do that. Um, it's it's a tough job. It's a it's a tough undertaking. And, and uh, that has not been my either forte or bent uh, to to love doing that. So probably no, I wouldn't I wouldn't run. But I I continue to support people who are running, and I hope that they get elected. Yeah, right. That's the important thing. Is a whole generation out there that needs to engage actively in politics. Well, I want to talk about one other possible career you could enter into, and that's uh, the career of author. Let me say uh, to start that. Uh, that the book, um, which is available on Amazon, I checked. Um, the book is is really well written. You know, people worry about lawyers writing books, you know, because there'll be a, a heretofore and a whereas and a where to herefore, whatnot. <laughs> but that's not this book. Um, you you have boiled your uh, rhetor your rhetoric, your prose down to very understandable, succinct statements with uh, relatively short sentences. Um, and it's very easy to read. It's not covered in legal. Um, did you consciously do that? I mean, or did you have to think about it? You know, when you write a, when you write up, when you speak to a jury, for example, you have to talk their language. When you speak to a judge or an appellate court, that's a different language. And I wonder what, what voice you were looking for when you wrote the book. Well, you, you know, I had a lot of help. Uh, one, my my daughter. Uh, Jenna and, and and my uh, brother Stephen helped me edit it down, uh, and and really were merciless uh, in their uh, criticism and their red penmanship. Um, but the, you know, writing a book is both easier and harder than you anticipate. It's easier to do it these days because uh, there's lots of resources available and a lot of stuff out there. But it's still harder than you and, and than I anticipated. Uh, because you can put it down on paper, uh, but then you have to be merciless in your editing. You, you really, you can't fall in love with your own words, um, and, and you just got to get to the point. Um, I really was trying to get to the point and make it a fast read and, and make it a lighter read, uh, even though there were some pretty dense subjects, some pretty dense legalese that formed the background of the decisions we were making and so it was it was a trick to try and 
figure out how to present that so that it could be understandable and give people the background about that without overburdening them. Um, and so that was that was the hard part. And, and quite frankly, it took a lot of editing um, and a lot of criticism uh, that that I took to heart. But, um, you know, getting criticism, um, boy, you hate that. Uh <laughs> <laughs> well, but better criticism before than after, you know what I mean? So how did you deal with the issue of the sacred cows? You know, some of these things, um, what did you call it, kiss and tell? Uh, <laughs> you know, are, are a little delicate to write up, but how did you deal with that? How did you resolve that in terms of your own approach? Well, my own approach was, you know, I like to see the positive in people and, and uh, the publisher told me, you know, if you're not going to kiss and tell, it doesn't sell as well. Um, <laughs> uh, but the fact of the matter is, is I, you know, I, I'm not, it's never been my uh, intention to, to, to try and hold people up to, to, to just criticize them or talk stink about them. Uh, that, that, that's not my nature. And really the point was, is, is just to let people know, here's what happened. Here's how I dealt with these things. And, and uh, sometimes I named people, sometimes I didn't name people. I didn't think it was necessary to, to name people who, who I was being critical of um, all the time. I, some of them I did. Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> Well, you, well, you know, this is a book where you really have to be conscious of those things, um, if, you know, because it's a, a book of history. Um, and, uh, you know, I suppose you have to be very careful. I mean, even before everybody, your family, whatnot, your editor gets in on you um, to state it correctly, maybe do some research, make sure that your recollection's right. And of course, to write it up. So, I mean, and lawyers do this all the time to write it up so that your language accurately reflects and expresses what you want to say. And I had the feeling that this book was just like that. You thought it through and you were, you were very determined to make every word an accurate statement of what you were saying. And that, that goes a long way. It's a credibility thing for the reader. Well, thank you, Jay. That's very nice of you to say that. I had a lot of help uh, because it's, it's, it's not always easy getting your thoughts down on paper and then, you know, I talked it through with, with a number of people and advisors who, who uh, you know, helped me form the thoughts and, and, and you know, what are, what are you really trying to say here? What, what, what's your real opinion? What, what, what are you really thinking about? Don't edge up to it. Let's just come right out and say it. Um, so. Okay, well, let's, let's examine that. All right, David, I, I uh, asked you to pick a couple of paragraphs um, <laughs> so we can actually have a sort of case study of that. Um, you know, revealed. So why don't you read a paragraph or two and tell us uh, what you were trying to say and what you did say and, and give us an example of your prose, if you don't mind. Okay, well, let me read uh, uh, one, uh, two passages from a chapter called Get a Dog. And, and the first uh, paragraph is, uh, let me read it this way. I have always thought of politics and government as a sumo wrestling match. Because of the large Japanese American population in Hawaii, and the large numbers of Japanese tourists who come to Hawaii, sumo wrestling used to be regularly on TV in the 1970s. Sumo is a contest of very large, half-naked men pushing and shoving each other to force the other out of the ring, to establish dominance, power, and authority. Politics and government are similar. There are many naked and sometimes fully, there are many half-naked and sometimes fully naked vested interests and people playing in the arena, pushing and shoving each other, vying for money, power, and influence. Government decisions, legislation, and regulations often directly affect the lives and fortunes of many people. The stakes are high. And then at the end of that- hey, what, a, what, a, what a perfect paragraph. Um, <laughs> and let me say, I did not hear any where to for or here to for or therefore or anything like that in that paragraph. <laughs> And then the, se the, the, the second paragraph is, is, it, uh, is, is as follows. Because the stakes are high and money, power, and prestige are on the line, the world of politics and government can be a rough and tumble environment. Under these circumstances, it is no surprise that people would try to get their way by doing and saying things that might be considered questionable or over the line. When politicians are trying to avoid blame or obtain a result, sometimes they do not care 
if they act in a manner that would not be countenanced by people of goodwill or among friends. That is simply the political world. As President Harry S. Truman famously said, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. <laughs> As I went forward, I realized that a number of my experiences were really just politics as usual. <laughs> what a lesson. You know, you, you have to get a PhD for serving for four years in, in, uh, in, in Hawaii. So, um, David, uh, you know, that's, that's nicely written. Uh, and I take it it was a, a good experience and a good outcome and a good book. Uh, it will go on the, on the bookshelves uh, uh, with, along with some very famous Hawaii historical reads. But query, what's your next book about? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question, Jay. I'm not sure I've got another book in me. If I was to do something, I'd want to do it about famous lawyers like you and, and have, have other uh, 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 notable people tell their stories uh, and then put it down. Because uh, it's not, I, I will tell you this, it's, it's not an easy process writing a memoir. Um, you got to really stick to it. And, and, and it, you know, I put it, I, I, I did it. I thought it was done. I sent it out to friends and, 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 uh, my, my family and, um, and they came back and said, huh, we don't think this is ready for prime time, David. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I went, oh, oh, that's disheartening. But I, I said, okay, that's fair enough. That's true. And so I went back, I put it down for a few months because it was, I was tired. And, and uh, then I went back and spent several more months editing and slashing and burning and, and just cutting it down as much as I could to make it a faster, better, more informative read. And that's uh, the way it came out, David. Let me say that, uh, you know, we, we know that a lot of information passes uh, these days in our 21st century, passed by social media, not necessarily by meeting face to face, but by social media and a certain amount of the newspaper, but the newspaper, newspapers have changed and we're actually doing a show soon enough about the decline of regional and local newspapers and how that affects our democracy. Um, and, you know, you look at, um, you know, the TV stations and uh, they, they repeat themselves a lot, but query, are they, are they drilling down the way they should? And what you find clearly is that if you want to know what really happened, you have to read a book. And books are more important than they were, you know, 10 or 20 years ago to the general population who wants to know what really happened. And this book is right there. This book tells us what really happened. So it, it, to me, writing a book like this, David, is a public service all in its own. Thank you very much for doing it. Oh, thank you, Jay. And, and that's why I think ThinkTech is so important that you provide thoughtful commentary, thoughtful analysis uh, for people who are who want to listen to just just you know people thinking about things and 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 analyzing things as opposed to just reporting a horse race or just reporting um, some some facts, which sometimes this is all that passes on the news, and that's unfortunate. Uh, but you're. Think Tech's doing a great job about that. And I, you know, it's been a real privilege to serve on your board. Thank you, David M. Louie. And a man who has allowed us to enter the Attorney General's office with him, to sit at his side, to sit at his shoulder and experience what he experienced. It's a great, it's a great tribute to a public official and it's a great benefit to the public. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much. Aloha. Aloha.